Hello, welcome to Hot Pot Talks as part of the panel series for Bitter Orientals, Yellow Peril Unmasked. My name is Jen Sunshine here with my dear friend and longtime creative partner, David Ng. Together, we are the co-artistic directors of Love Intersections, a media arts collective that produces intersectional and intergenerational film and artwork from underrepresented communities. We're also founding members of the Vancouver Artists Labor Union Cooperative, also known as Value Co-op, which is an artist-run worker cooperative whose goal is to provide flexible living wage income to artists. Before we begin, we want to acknowledge that we are gathered here today from the unceded and ancestral territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and tsleil nations. Part of our work as labor activists and queer artists on unceded territories means working in solidarity with ongoing indigenous struggles for sovereignty, decolonization, reparations, and land back. Hapa Talks emerged during the pandemic from our collaboration with the Lim Association in Chinatown, historically a neighborhood of Chinese railroad laborers who were brought to settle indigenous territories as part of the ongoing colonial project. Oh, David, you are muted. Of course I am. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Jen. <laughs> um, so why Hot Pot Talks? Um, so as Jen mentioned, Value Co-op has a studio in the Lim Sai Hor Kao Mok Association building. Um, and when we were invited to lease that studio, we had really long conversations as a cooperative, um, thinking about you know the roles that artists have played, not sometimes not so good in the neighborhood, but thinking about things like gentrification. And so when we went in, when we um, signed the lease, to the studio, we were very intentional about um, building reciprocal relationships with the association and with the neighborhood. Um, and yeah, so over the past few years, um, I'm actually very excited. This is the first time we're actually announcing it or revealing it. Um, we've been digitizing their archives and uh, building the association a website, um, which I'm going to now drop a link in the chat because it's I'm very proud. Thank you to Benji and Jen for putting uh, doing the legwork for the website. Um, but yeah, it's it's finally up. So it's been uh, it's been two years um, in the making. Um, over the past few years, um, the t the past few years have brought to the surface already existing yellow peril narratives, re-emerging again during the pandemic. We've seen Chinatowns and elders targeted by racial violence and vandalism. We've seen a rise of boba, lib boba liberal organizing around stop Asian hate demands for hate crime legislation, uh, which is pro-police, pro-surveillance, and that harms Black and Indigenous communities. We've seen gentrification eating at the souls of Chinatowns and other BIPOC communities seemingly with no end in sight. We are bitter, bitter Orientals indeed. Uh, so the title Bitter Orientals Yellow Apparel on Mask grows from uh, the Engaging Chinatown project that we've been doing with the association, um, as well as our own organizing on issues related to anti-Asian racism. Um, so this panel series will touch on themes of diaspora, xenophobia, systemic racism, intersectional solidarity building, and Chinatown futurities. Um, one more plug. Um, so you may have noticed in our new intro video, um, we designed these, oh, as Jen has them up on the screen there, um, these defund, disarm, disband the police red envelopes um, that are uh, for sale. Um, and the link is going to be dropped in the chat right now. Um, and proceeds to these sales will go to the work of uh, the defund 604 network. 
Before I introduce our guests today, I want to thank our incredible team, Ava and Cameron, who helped make Hoppa Talks a reality. Um, without oh, for a sorry, I, I, sorry to interrupt, Jen. We should also <laughs> thank um, Vancouver Moving Theater and the Downtown East Side Heart of the City yes, Festival they um, for supporting. Yeah, for supporting this conversation. We're so excited that, to be able to do this. Thank you, David. Um, we're so excited to introduce our two guests today, Lai Wan and Kimberly Wan. Lai Wan is a cultural activist, artist, writer, and educator with a practice based in poetics and philosophy. Born in Zimbabwe of Chinese parents, her family immigrated to Canada in 1977 to leave the war in Rhodesia. She has engaged embodiment through performativity, audio, music, improvisation, with varieties of media, along with bodily and emotional intelligence, so as to unravel and engage presence. Recent public commissions have also enable, enabled her to focus on issues of urban development, touching on poetics and philosophic uh, themes related to current questions of environment and the built cityscape of Vancouver. Her project, How Water Remembers, explores a return of mudflat inhabitants in Chinatown, continues in phase two with public engagement through 2022. She currently has an exhibition work from 1980 to 2000 at the Morris and Helen Belkin Gallery at UBC. Kimberly Wan, Huang Zhuangzi, she they is a queer Cantonese femme whose work mirrors the intersections of her identity. Kimberly is the race and equity program manager with Hua Foundation and served from 2019 to 2021 as co-chair of the city of Vancouver's Chinatown Legacy Stewardship Group. Welcome, Iwan and Kimberly. Hi. Hi, both. <laughs> Kimberly, I really tried. I was like, I'm going to I'm going to say like, Kimberly's man name impressive. in Mandarin. And then I stumble through the words but i still tried <laughs> I really stumble through it myself which is why i just put it in writing but thank you. i appreciate that i was like i have to honor it because she wrote it so <laughs> i thought what about a kick for a kickoff um to kick off this conversation how did how do you guys know each other kimberly and, and laiwan it was magic <laughs> <laughs> It's always such a pleasure to work with Kimberly, and um, I think we met before working together at the LSG, the Legacy Stewardship Group, um, probably at some social or something, but I can't remember the exact date. Maybe Kimberly remembers. I certainly do. <laughs> <laughs> the time I met you, Laiwan, was actually when you were being given an award at a screening for the Vancouver Queer Film Festival, mm -hmm. and I was the person who ushered you towards where you had to go up to the stage. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I was quite starstruck, so I didn't say, I don't think it's too many words, but um, that was the first time we officially met. Oh, thank you. I mean, I, I, you know, I think I was in shock, so I was probably like just, yeah, <laughs> in stage fright. <laughs> Um, so I thought maybe, you know, why don't we start off um, with something, I mean, th thinking about the themes of Chinatown futures. Um, you guys have, you, the, the two of you have been in the thick of Chinatown mm -hmm. organizing. Um, can you tell us a little bit about the layers of the organizing that you've seen and witnessed? Um, so things that are in innovative or inspiring um, that you've, you've seen? I'm going to let Kimberly start because she has been <laughs> she has been in the thicker of it than I have, um, and I really respect her for that. So, um, Kimberly, sure, yeah. So, I mean, um, I guess my journey to Chinatown started when I first attended a dumpling workshop. I think in 2015 with Hua Foundation, my current employer. <laughs> and it was um, a really like low barrier way to engage with culture. Um, we went around Chinatown and, and shopped for groceries for dumplings with an auntie. Um, and, and I think that was the first time that I remember being in Chinatown consciously as an adult, not being dragged by my grandparents to grocery shop uh, over weekends as a, as a child. Um, but I, I became engaged with Chinatown organizing, or as you say, in the thick of it, um, through 105 Kiefer, which in 2017 was a development proposal um, that you know, broke records for engagement at City Hall, brought forward conversations about things like translation and equitable access to, you know, particip participatory consultations at the City of Vancouver. 
Um, and then from there, I think, um, continued to work with Hua Foundation, got hired by them. And, um, you know, through just because community is like this, um, decided that I wanted to apply to be a part of the Chinatown Legacy Stewardship Group. Um, there was an open call for folks to apply to be a part of it. So it, you know, includes now over 36 members, including folks like clan or benevolent associations, nonprofit organizations, individuals who are stakeholders in the neighborhood, social service organizations, arts and culture groups, things like that. Um, and I ran to be one of two co-chairs uh, in 2019 and one. So um, that's how I know I won primarily <laughs> that work and um, have since taken a step back from that role actually uh, to reinvestigate the, the kind of work that I want to do in Chinatown, mm -hmm. um, uh, especially as somebody who came to that space just really, really wanting to connect with my ancestors' spaces because I'm fifth generation Chinese Canadian and my ancestors were railroad, railroad workers. So um, yeah, I think learning more about the trauma that I hold around that space and um, seeing that from a lens of things like neurodivergency um, has made me take a step back and take the time to reflect on the powers that be in Chinatown. <laughs> mm. Yeah, I have great appreciation and gratitude for Kimberly and the work of um, you know, your generation, because you are so young, uh, entering into uh, positions of great responsibility. So in terms of, say, today, you know, I'm, this is 2022, and I'm now 60. And, um, you know, in terms of activism, I've been act an activist in Vancouver since the late 80s. Uh, in queer activism. Mm -hmm. And I think that it's such a refreshing thing to see young folks like Kimberly entering, being very brave and entering with, with a lot of skill and articulation mm -hmm. and a lot of um, background to all the intersectional issues of the day. I think that's a really positive thing in terms of uh, activism today in 2022. Mm -hmm. um, even though the climate is so different from, say, you know the late 80s um the the questions are different but the urgency is 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 just as great uh i i remember in the 80s being very worried about ronald reagan and there was reason to be worried about ronald mm -hmm. reagan and so everything that we are encountering today is an effect of ronald reagan mm -hmm. and you know the warning of some very mild-mannered you know, possibly personable person who used to be in movies or was a movie star. Back then, you know, the majority of people didn't see the danger of this. But, you know, uh, 40 somewhat years later, we see all the effects of that neoliberalism mm -hmm. and um, the greater importance of being involved actively as, as a citizen, being concerned about um, the shifts that are happening. And I think mm -hmm. uh, Kimberly's introduction into 105 Kiefer Street and um, just the whole symbolic nature of 105 Kiefer, C Kiefer Street and what what has what has you know what ha that has become in terms of sort of overall understanding of the situation in Chinatown mm -hmm. um, and the the meaningfulness of 105 Kiefer Street. So, mm -hmm. I mean, in, in terms of working in, with institutions. Um, I like the idea that um, Wayne K. Yang introduces, which he also wrote it under the name La Paper Sun. And it's the what he proposes as the cyborg, but it's spelled with an S, so it's S C Y B O R G. Mm -hmm. And basically he's he's proposing that we infiltrate systems. So in what ways in what ways do we infiltrate systems? So mm -hmm. I'm gonna leave it there. Mm -hmm. Well, I love that because I think as queers, we have, we've ha learned over time, over a long period of time to inf infiltrate and, mm -hmm. and adapt, you know, in the same way that I think water moves and adapts in spaces mm -hmm. and, and, and gaps. Um, as queers, I think we've, we've been doing that for a very, very long time. Mm -hmm. um, there was something, I think, Laiwani had, you know, when, when you're 
describing Kimberly, um, there was something that you said um, that I thought was really interesting about the generation um, and Kimberly's generation. Um, I, Kimberly, I feel like I feel like our generation and younger, there's so much weight and 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 stress it navigating this climate in this stage of you know capitalism and 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 the world and where it's going um i'm wondering if you can tell us a little bit because when you and i met kimberly you you entered my world um uh, in this like environmental justice kind of way and um actually a lot of the the, the lessons that i've learned um about climate justice, in fact, were from you. Um, I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about where you're at in your, in your, yeah, in, in, in your activism. Um, <laughs> because I'm also seeing a link with, um, with uh, Laiwan, mm -hmm. with How mm -hmm. Water, How Water Remembers and Laiwan's story, which I also want to hear um, about the heron at the Sun Yat Sen Garden. So I think there's a lot of overlap here with you know, the environment, with the land, um, with water. So I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about your philosophies and work. <laughs> That's a big <laughs> question. <laughs> Just had to dive right in. <laughs> um, uh, so, I mean, um, in high school, I'll take it back to high yeah. school. <laughs> Do I'm, it. Um, a 16 year old who really loved musical theater and um, I loved musical theater for so many reasons, one of them being that I was highly closeted and a lot of queer people were there. Mm -hmm. um, but also, <laughs> um, also uh, I found like a, a purpose kind of in the things that I was doing there, I was spending a lot of time with the people who were there and one of the folks happened to be the daughter of two very notable uh, UBC professors who work on climate science and also um, from a political standpoint, um, climate justice. Um, and um, she kind of started something called Kids for Climate Action. And we started as a group of musical theater nerds who did flash mobs around public spaces, singing about um, stopping climate change. You know, one of our favorite ones was climate change is coming to town to the... <laughs> <laughs> um, we did it in malls and we had choreography and everything. Um, it was fun, but I think uh, just skipping forward a couple of years um, in the time that I had invested and spent in that movement at that time. So that was around, I guess, 2013 to around 2015 or 16. Um, yeah, graduation. I graduated in 2013. <laughs> sound, making my sound sound younger than I am. But um <laughs> So I think I realized that the narratives that were being used in a lot of the campaigns mm -hmm. um, that were spouting things, particularly around China, um, were extremely xenophobic mm -hmm. and xenophobic. And um, the people that I was, uh, you know, raising these concerns to really didn't listen. Um, and I was at that point much younger than I am now, had less understanding of how to navigate these systems or speak up for myself or, um, you know, understand how I was being tokenized in those spaces. And so um, I think left that space as a result of that. Mm -hmm. And now I do a lot of work to ensure that there is space for other Asian youth who might uh, feel similarly powerless in these systems uh, to be able to engage uh, on a like low barrier level with things like culture and identity so that when they are approached with these things that we still live in, like capitalism and you know white supremacy in these systems that we are trying to change but won't happen overnight, they'll understand a little bit better where their own power comes from and where that stems from, perhaps mm -hmm. where the shame that they feel comes from and um, how to work through their own trauma to heal and help others do the same. So I think right now that's where my philosophy is. I'm reading this book, for example. I handily have it right next to me, oh. <laughs> <laughs> called My Grandmother's Hands, um, Racialized Trauma and the Pathway to Mending Our Hearts and Bodies. But it, it talks a lot about how, and I think it, this relates to our conversations about Chinatown, about how trauma can live in intergenerational ways and in our bodies and manifest in a lot of ways that we don't um, mm -hmm. know and can't recognize in a lot of uh, formats mm -hmm. that are dampened by the systems that we live under. <sighs> 
Lie one. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <laughs> I was just so in uh, deep in thought of mm. what Kimberly has been saying. Mm. Um, in terms of philosophies and in terms of climate, um, as an artist, something that I'm very, um, I guess, have come to be aware of in terms of practice is how climate is within us. Mm. And um, that as artists, we understand that whatever is internal is also mirrored externally. Mm -hmm. And in what ways can we understand the weather systems within ourselves? Um, and I say this not in terms of some kind of individualistic, you know, implosion way, but in the sense of how do we engage with others and in what ways do we uh, build constructively? Uh, in what ways are we open to other systems, other weather systems, other climate systems? Uh, and this goes back to uh, the question of biodiversity and cultural diversity. So a lot of my work in Chinatown is very much centered in um, the very big concern of industrialization and capitaliz capitalism and colonialism that has bulldozed its way through alternative habitats. And that includes biodiverse habitats and it also includes cultural habitats. So I see Chinatown as one of these alternative cultural habitats uh, to, you know, the that has stood up and that has formed in response to um, capitalism and colonialism, especially in, in, in terms of the legislated exclusion of um, you know, Asian peoples and people of color and BIPOC people and indigenous people um, from white systems and uh, industrialized systems and uh, colonialism. Um, well, the way, the way colonialism extracts and excludes. And so mm. um, I'm very interested in how Chinatown is morphing um, in the same way that the pandemic is asking the whole world to morph at this mm -hmm. time. Um, mm. There's a lot of things that are coming up onto the chopping block. And uh, depending on who is being agile and who is being really highly adaptable, and again, like... Um, Jen has often used the, the metaphor of water. And we have, you know, in Taoist uh, philosophy and in, you know, Chinese medicine, we have a lot of sort of teachings about um, other ways of knowing the world, other ways of being in the world. Mm -hmm. And uh, I really see the, the, the great possibilities of uh, those resurfacing in Chinatown. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to leave it there. This is reminding me of a core core memory. I don't know what it was that Laiwan, you're just the way that you're speaking, just it, it, the, the, how, how evocative it is, is tapping into some core memory of mine. Um, I remember when I immigrated to Canada um, at around nine and it was just me and my dad. My mom was, of course, you know, um, making money back home in Taiwan. And I went to elementary school in a suburb in Port Moody. And I remember my dad would always walk me to, to school. And so every morning we would walk up and we immigrated, it was like fall time. And so there's a very distinct like olfactory association that I have mm -hmm. with fall. And it, it like brings me all the way back to when I first came to Canada. Um, there's that distinct fall smell the dampness in the air, the, the just, just how wet everything is. And we also lived on a mountain, right? Mm -hmm. So we would walk up this big hill to get to my elementary school and it would be fall, so it would be like pouring. It's your typical Pacific Northwest kind of weather system. And of course, when that happens, the side we're on the sidewalk and um, all of the earthworms would be washed onto the sidewalk. And because my... I come from a long generation of Buddhists. My dad would every step when he would encounter an earthworm um, that's like in our way, he would pick it up and then put it back um, into the grass next to it. And it was just such a simple act that he did for, for every time he walked me to school. And I don't, I, I, it never phased me. It never, I was never kind of like, why are you doing this? I just, I always knew why. He didn't want um, people to stand, trample and step on and kill mm -hmm. um, the worms. Um, but as an adult, 
thinking back on that, like it's just it's that internal weather system. I think you speak of Laiwan <laughs> that that is so defined by these like key core moments. So mm -hmm. thought I share that <laughs> story. <laughs> no worries, and I I. I also want to connect it to all the other critters that make up what human is, mm -hmm. right? There's a, there's a lot of other systems within us. And then we're also sympoetic with all other systems. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I think there's a lot of uh, sort of issues that are coming to light in terms of human exceptionalism and mm -hmm. anthropocentrism, thinking mm -hmm. that we are the sole, you know, creators of the world or... But meanwhile, you know, the, the gut by bacteria is can mm -hmm. can do us in or mm -hmm. the pandemic can do mm -hmm. us in. So I think how we move forward, as well as in Chinatown, if we're talking about Chinatown futures, um, how we can sort of bring all of those things together and mm -hmm. including, you know, the, mm -hmm. the little earthworms. I wanted to, this, this is bringing up, um, uh, uh, bring us back to the earlier conversation um, around Laiwan. You were talking about Ronald Reagan <laughs> and this sort of this this um, but like this um, the, the 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 temporal relationship we have to Chinatown organizing. And I'm just thinking about this topic of futures, right? Mm -hmm. But like thinking about, I mean, thinking about envisioning the future, but also how do we hold the past in our organizing of, of mm -hmm. future? And, you know, it's, it's, it's been something that, you know, um, I haven't been, I've been on the very periphery of Chinatown organizing, if I can even say that I was on the periphery for many years until we moved into the value co-op, co-op studio. And, so I've been going through my own like, you know, relationship, you know, with thinking through my my great grandparents, you know, relationships within with the neighborhood as well. And thinking about the symbol of Chinatown and the the release also the the really heightened sociopolitical tensions in the neighborhood. What is my place in all of this? Do I have a place mm -hmm. in all of this? Just because I'm Chinese, <laughs> should I be involved? You know? And but it, I, I'm also reflecting on how, you know, Chinatown um, and not just Van Vancouver, Chinatown's actually all the Chinatowns that I know of. And I don't know of a lot of them, but, you know, Montreal, Toronto, Edmonton, also of being like a, a, a space where like a lot of really generative organizing, sometimes not so generative, mm -hmm. but really exciting um, intersections of organizing are also happening as well. Um, I don't have a qu question formulated about that, but I guess my, I guess there's, I'm, I'm, well, my curiosity is around how to, around, um, Chinatown as this, as a, as, as a symbol of the past, uh, of uh, inequity, inequ inequality of the past. And what do, what, what does that hold in terms of our envisioning of the future? Hmm. Kimberly, would you like to go? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I'm just thinking about like back to the earlier conversation as well, how we've each come to Chinatown. Um, what I often um, help when I'm speaking to youth that we engage with, um, we often draw them towards history first. And of course, history is told in a biased way because historians are not unbiased. But, um, you know, no community is a, a monolith and certainly not Chinatown. Um, and I also want to comment that Chinatown itself is a term that was dictated, not by the community, but by British colonial officers. So, you know, it's a very notable term that associates what they perceived, uh, which is majority Chinese men in a segregated area and what it actually was. And like from Vancouver, Chinatown's conception, really white supremacist power tactics have been used to divide and conquer it. Mm -hmm. So when Southern Chinese laborers started to immigrate or be brought over as laborers for the railroad and other nearby industry, they were placed in the marsh that used to be named Squatchai's, as Jen said in the beginning, um, that we now know as Chinatown. So Chinatown and its inhabitants have been placed by the British there and were divided like other racialized groups into a distinct set of borders that dictated where and how they could exist. And in essence, because these communities had to fight for their existence uh, you know, including the right to practice cultural traditions like 
making barbecue meats, which still technically goes against Canadian food safety. <laughs> <laughs> As a community, they were like from their conception placed in a in competition with other racialized communities that have also been sectioned to neighborhoods for them by white supremacy and its policies. So this in all facets of work in Chinatown and beyond has resulted in a sort of scarcity narrative. Mm -hmm. There mm -hmm. are a set amount of resources for our communities uh, and therefore we must be in competition with one another. You know, whether it's land or, or project grants um, and that includes like inter-community competition as well, so infighting. Um, yeah, and you know, all the while, this is really just white supremacy working the way it's supposed to, to keep racialized communities who combined are a threat to its power. Um, and uh, you know, it's meant to keep us under its control, to be more easily manipulated to its favor. Divide and conquer. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, I was gonna say divide and conquer as well, but it, you know, there, Bureaucracy and colonial bureaucracy was created to, um, you know, not empower us, and in in some ways, there we've you know we've we've been able to break through certain bureaucracies and say, for example, are allowed to buy a house now, which you know in the early days you weren't allowed to buy a house as a Chinese person, um, but in terms of the speed at which sort of um, action is taken against you know, bylaws that we might break compared to bylaws that, you know, a white person or like a trucker uh, barbecuing a, a pig on the streets of Ottawa today, there still nothing has happened to them, right? So we understand we're getting a better sense of our place within each of these cities, what our, what our, what our limitations are. And so when you talk about the tensions and the heightened um, sort of activism that's happening. Uh, on some levels, that's because of the urgency. And some of that urgency is this acceleration of Reagan, Reaganomics, neoliberalism, gentrification that has really targeted places like Chinatown because mm -hmm. they they were, you know, on, on another level, I I I think of Hastings Street and how Hastings Street for for years was just neglected and Chinatown for years was neglected. And I, I think sometimes these are these are strategies to deliberately impoverish certain yeah. certain neighborhoods so that they can be gentrified, right? Mm. Um, and artists as well. And uh, we have to be very careful to not just go in there because there's cheap uh, studios or, yeah. uh, you know, there's, there's possibility for us to make art there. Um, and so the question of what is our roles and this this idea of Chineseness, Chineseness for me is highly, highly complex and highly problematic because yeah. you know I was mm. I was raised in apartheid Rhodesia and um, there was legislated you know systems for for colored people and what you were allowed to do and what you weren't allowed to do and so um, a lot of my analysis and criticism is in relation to systems and what are the systems doing and what what do they want in this moment so a lot of the challenge and why the accelerated activism that's happening say in the last particularly the last five years in Chinatown is because if we don't act now it Chinatown's really going to go and mm -hmm. I think we're seeing this across mm -hmm. uh, North America and it's because of um, you know gentrification wants to be everywhere and so it goes back to um, which which habitats are we protecting? Um, mm. And so I think that, you know, as a Chinese person in Chinatown, I don't have a greater right to be active mm. in Chinatown than anybody else. But in terms of the alliances and the solidarity uh, and the belief in um, sort of all those intangible heritages that multiple peoples practiced in Chinatown, uh, are a form of resistance to the much larger systems of gentrification that wants to bulldoze everything to look the same and to be totally, really expensive, unaffordable, and, um, you know, look all the same, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. and probably badly built. Um, so mm -hmm. any kind of protection we can have to... Um, you know, create alternative communities, communities that are built on care, that are built on, um, you know, working through 
traumas and intergenerational traumas and doing that respectfully within what I'm calling the ghetto or the village that we currently call Chinatown. Mm -hmm. um, it reminds me, um, Kimberly, when we had our pre uh, in our chat conversation, and uh, we were talking about the the um, we were talking about displacement um, in the neighborhood and in in the broader community. Um, can you tell me a little bit more about that? Yeah, I suppose so. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Sorry to put you on this. We, we, no, I, well, I, I was just thinking we, we talked about 105 Kiefer, um, but I think we, what we, we kind of talked about a larger, the larger implications of, of displacement. Um, and there's intersections there around obviously race and class um, and space and geography. And yeah, I mean, the changes that we as a, we've observed in Vancouver's Chinatown and across Chinatowns in Canada and, uh, you know, in Gold Mountain um, are distressing. And, you know, gentrification, the slow exodus of legacy businesses in the neighborhood is also extremely concerning. Mm. It can feel immediate and urgent because it is. But, I mean, I also don't think that, for example, directing our immediate hate and anger towards, like, white-owned small businesses who are gentrifying the neighborhood uh, or dangly earringed young white queer shop will solve this problem. Right. Um, which is often what happens. Uh, you know, they're there and they're not going anywhere and directing our anger towards them also doesn't get to the root of why legacy businesses are shutting down or leaving the neighborhood. Uh, I think like a lot of this has to do again with the systems that are designed for white businesses to succeed and to racialize businesses to not. Um, you know, Canada as a colonial state prioritizes and makes it easier for particularly white and upper class businesses to succeed, uh, to be open, to seen as highbrow, to be seen as cool, to access mm -hmm. support from the government, which we saw over COVID, for example. Um, and we've seen this in a lot of ways throughout the pandemic. Mm -hmm. um, but I think that I'll get to displacement in a second, I swear. <laughs> <laughs> Take your time. <laughs> My observation, um, too, in, in the way that it believes that Chinatown can exist mm -hmm. in the 1960s, can be another form of advocating for displacement of people who are also marginalized by systems of oppression. So it's it's also kind of gatekeeping because I think that if you look behind the thin veil of people saying they want Chinatown to be like it was in the past, they aren't just saying that they want businesses to thrive again or that they want to see lots of people visiting with their families again. They're saying that Chinatown used to be here, mm -hmm. used to be explicitly just traditionally Chinese, uh, used to be a place that they could like be served tea by their wives for hours mm -hmm. used to be place that they could separate from the problems of the downtown east side and that it used to be easy to forget selective neighbors of ours you mm -hmm. know undesirable neighbors quote unquote and i think they're also saying that anyone new in chinatown doesn't belong because you know when we separate ourselves from the downtown east side we assert colonial narratives of boundaries and we gatekeep resources mm -hmm. and things that are flashy like heritage conservation and culture mm -hmm. um but like Chinatown has never only existed in the city limits of the neighborhood boundaries, uh, which are quite small. It's always expanded further, um, you know, because of food systems, different kinds of wealth. So, you know, seeing Chinatown as a part of the downtown east side and advocating for all of the residents as a part of the neighborhood uh, to not be displaced by building things like affordable housing is important to me. And I think is, is important to community members who are organizing for these kinds of things. Um, because our problems as Chinatown don't exist in a vacuum. Mm. Um, they don't, it only exists within the boundaries of the neighborhood that the city's designated. So mm. really, I think like working together and slow building relationships and trust between Chinatown and those who would traditionally work in the downtown east side is really important to achieve equity for all of us mm. and to advocate for, for um, you know, not being displaced. Mm. I th you know, I'm hearing a sort of a running theme between our this conversation around um, there's a level of reciprocity and also how do we, yes, think about in the intersections of racial and, you know, uh, intersecting oppressions, but also how do we also think about recalibrating our relationships to some of these themes that you're discussing, Kimberly, like around displacement. Um, and 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 other pe people's lived experiences because i'm thinking you know jen we, we've been quite harsh on i mean given when we moved into the neighborhood where, you know we as in value co-op we were really interrogating artists you know art we started value co-op because artists are also one of the most precarious mm -hmm. employment wise they face very very deep 
precarity. But I think sort of the 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 as we've kind of discussed before, the sort of getting a studio because it's cheap and having no sort of thinking about a reciprocal relationship to the possibility or the actuality that you displaced <laughs> someone there is is sort of a key or an underlying um, uh, issue as well. I don't recommend starting a co-op um, at the start of a <laughs> pandemic. So. Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> November, we, we incorporated November, 2019. Um, <laughs> it was a terrible time. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I mean, in some ways, uh, you know, in a twisted way, I, I'm, what I'm grateful um, about when it comes to the pandemic is that it revealed failure. It revealed mm -hmm. so many things. It, it revealed state failure. It revealed all sorts of failures. But it also revealed that the things that we thought were impossible, um, like conversations around universal income, uh, mutual aid, like those things mm -hmm. became possible during the pandemic. So mm -hmm. um, in some ways, it's uh, it's very, we're still in it, I think. Um, mm -hmm. So um, yeah, I'm not sure where I'm going with this, but. Yeah, I think that places like Chinatown, perhaps the origins of it um, had sort of informal forms of barter, mutual aid, mm -hmm. um, looking after your neighbor. Um, perhaps there were other dramas um, that were were not uh, <laughs> that were not necessarily um, constructive socially. But on another level, if we if we want to look at models for how really oppressed people who were forced to live in a ghetto, who were not given resources to build that ghetto, and who, when they succeeded financially, would often get, uh, you know, uh, you know, some injustice would happen where part of their business would be stolen or any of these things. You can see that um, some of those mutual aid bartering systems, some of those discount, uh, you know, renting of rooms to, to single single workers, et cetera. Those are really good um, models to be looking at uh, during the pandemic and post-pandemic mm -hmm. as to how to say that these are values that are really central to Chinatown or to a place like Chinatown. And that Chinatown is not all the stereotypes that, uh, you know, and tourism that people have constructed it to be. Um, but going back to displacement, I think that there are larger systemic things that uh, really need to be addressed, but haven't been addressed for decades. And this can be seen in something like, very obviously, like the opioid crisis. Mm -hmm. So the opioid crisis, I'm, I'm still shocked that we're still here. You know, it's like, what, what bureaucracy is not doing what it's meant to, to do to protect uh, local folks? And it's not just in the downtown east side now, it's, it's spreading into suburbs and everywhere. So um, there's something very fundamental about being in the downtown east side, which we need to um, find new systems for. And we can see how, say, governments are not thinking systemically. So, you know, all, all the schools in, in Canada have not been, you know, sort of fixed with HVAC systems. Instead, they're giving mm -hmm. single, single little HVAC systems to a classroom, possibly one per school. Um, so they're really not thinking systemically. And it's the same with the opioid crisis and the housing crisis. Mm -hmm. um, and so we see how we're still in the thick of neoliberal um, policies that have um, really cut uh, social safety nets. And so something as simple as the kindness to build a washroom in a neighborhood mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and why we have this huge problem in Chinatown and the downtown east side of people not having washrooms and this being accelerated because of the pandemic mm -hmm. um, just shows the level of lack of social safety nets. Yeah. And, and this goes back to also sort of um, mental health services and the escalation of um, you know the loss the loss of um sort of ha mental health um mm. within the pandemic so all of these things are all related and for those who are at the lowest lower end of having any resources are going to be subject to feeling the effect of having no social safety nets anymore so i think coming through the pandemic we need to be thinking about how to create social systems 
uh, and mm. especially in pockets like the downtown east side where there are much more um, established systems in place for people's social social safety nets mm. i hope that answers what you were asking about <laughs> no, thank you um lai Wan, i was wondering um I wanted to, I was wondering if you could, uh, I was telling you right before um, we started this episode, I went and got one of these cars. Oh, yes. <laughs> Can you tell us about your project, um, How Water Remembers? And I'm particularly curious, because we're talking about Chinatown, um, mm -hmm. that that uh, that activation activity, What's what what was the intention behind it? Because I think it's it's really great. Mm -hmm. Oh, thank you. Um, I should I should just say that, you know, activism is a, is a really sort of, complex word and so I'm I'm a person who's always strategizing it's like strategizing how to constructively and uh, reciprocity with repre reciprocity um, engage and help sort of fuel or nourish uh, communities I think socially engaged art practices can be really problematic sometimes so uh, with how water remembers, I was, you know, I've been, I've been really interested in the water behind Chinatown for a while. And um, one thing that we had talked about, I think, uh, was how I was haunted by an image that I found online in about 2013. Um, and I didn't know what this image was. It was an image of water under a bridge, and I didn't know where it was. I just knew it was somewhere in Vancouver. And so that feeling of hauntedness, the, the feeling that, you know, it's in the body. It's not simply something that I think, oh, this would be a great project to do. Mm -hmm. um, and so when I got a CBC residency for their, pro their their venue, The Wall, and I asked the media archivist at that time, you know, do you know where this is? And he said, come back in two weeks. And, and, um, and he had a video for me when I came back in two weeks and it was the 1956 CBC film called Summer Afternoon. And it follows two little boys on their haphazard adventures in Chinatown. And there was this bridge and it's it's right behind the Sun Yat-sen where the water of the False Creek, um, the False Creek used to come right up to behind the Sun Yat-sen. So what oh. we know is Andy, mm -hmm. Livingston, Andy Livingston Park is actually all used to be water. And the reason mm -hmm. why there's, you know, AstroTurf on that, on the soccer fields is because if there wasn't AstroTurf, you'd be yeah. in mud. Right? Yes. So, <laughs> so mm. how water remembers, I was very interested by, um, you know, not, not, well, I was interested or inspired by a map that the city of Vancouver had published in relation to sea level rise. And uh, it was of the False Creek um, waters. And in a hundred years when sea, the sea level rise had risen, um, the false creek that came up that comes up behind Chinatown looks like a dragon. Mm -hmm. So um, I wanted to create a um, culturally appropriate work uh, for Chinatown um, that kind of highlights um, the inter intertidal critters that may have once lived behind the Sun Yat-sen gardens. And maybe, you know, that water that is in the Sun Yat-sen Gardens. Maybe it, it's still connected somehow to the yeah. False Creek waters. Um, but when sea level rise happens, um, there's going to be water back behind uh, yeah. the Sun Yat-sen again, or there's going to be intertidal uh, critters possibly coming back. And this is where the heron, there's a great blue heron that's living that right now in the Sun Yat-sen Gardens. And she came probably last fall or last summer. Um, I saw her in October. That's the first time that I saw her. She's just astounding. And she has created a home for herself at the Sun Yat Sen Garden. She's still there. And I don't know what she's feeding on, but she's hunting in that water. <laughs> the koi are no longer there. So um, there's something that she's feeding on. And um, she has such a poise and grace and elegance. And it's so fitting within this mm -hmm. Taoist architecture that has uh, you know, that the Sun Yat-sen buildings ha were designed by. Um, mm. And so I saw, and I was already, I had already begun this project, How Water Remembers, and folks can learn more about it on my website. It's just too complicated to describe <laughs> right now. Uh, but there are 20 creatures that are printed on cards, and David has one of those cards. 
And there are 20 shops in Chinatown that are distributing these cards. Um, and folks can go, it's kind of like a scavenger hunt. You can go to find the various uh, stores. There's a map um, on my website where you can uh, find the stores. And you know, do give a tip to the to the to the business owner for the card. And um, once you've collected all twenty, you can play the divination game. So there's a there's a divination game that's uh, downloadable uh, from my website, and it was developed with uh, you know in collaboration with Cindy Mochizuki, another artist, mm. um, great artist in Vancouver. And uh, the illustrations of the cards um, of the critters was done by Carleen Harvey, who's a fantastic illustrator. And the back of the card is the uh, illustration by Marlene Nguyen. So there's a lot of folks who've contributed uh, beautifully to this project. Um, but it's a way to imagine how can we live with other biodiverse critters. Mm -hmm. And I think in Chinatown, and especially in terms of our ancestral sort of heritage in terms of Taoist um, philosophy and, um, you know, learning how to live uh, with a certain kind of balance. Um, mm -hmm. yeah. So this is something that I'm sort of envisioning for, for Chinatown, which is mm. um, a beautiful place that's uh, a home for all these critters. And um, fantastically, this, this phase two was uh, sponsored by the uh, sea to city program that's part of the city um, so there are you know architects and um, folks in planning who are trying to mitigate the sea level rise in Vancouver and they really like this project and mm. the idea of um, you know intertidal habitats uh, which is really great and really crucial because um, if you want to mitigate sea level rise you don't build walls because we as we learn from uh, Stanley Park, having a wall around Stanley Park is actually quite violent. It, mm. uh, it creates a, a zone where nothing can live because the waves are just crashing against the, the walls and so nothing can live there. Mm. We would mm. rather create a, a zone where people, where not people, but people, but also critters can live, right? Um, mm. And critters that are intermingling and sort of uh, benefiting each other. That's That's how the whole natural world uh, yeah. exists is we're all interdependent there's no separation mm -hmm. so um you know the pandemic is a lot of scientists are saying this the pandemic is going to accelerate we're going to have more pandemics if we don't yeah. address the issue of the loss of biodiversity so i mm -hmm. think chinatown is a great place where uh, we can be looking at this and i see the Great blue heron as a blessing. She's mm -hmm. one of the first guardians who has arrived. Who mm -hmm. has arrived? I this is that. like this is beautiful yeah. and and mm -hmm. very solar punk. Um, and, <laughs> and and what you just described, Laiwan, too. You answered my question, which I was going to ask next, um, which was if you could design um, your own version of um, Chinatown, informed by all of these, you know, informed by this conversation. Um, perhaps Kimberly, you can um, take us take a jab at this, answering this question. How would you design this future, Chinatown future? My little weepy heart. I was on the verge of tears as you were speaking. <laughs> Tell more. Um, uh, how would I design it? I don't, I don't think I have the brain space to be able to do that, to be quite honest and a little bit traumatized by being in Chinatown these days. Mm. And it's hard to think about its futures when that space holds such um, yeah, trauma for me right now, yeah. especially mm. given the past year and a bit of constant media interviews, particularly as it relates to violence against mm. Asian women. Um, this is an aside and a tangent, but Chinatown is always used as a backdrop for all these stories and any ah. engagement with the China, Chinese community or Asian community, Chinatown is always used as a backdrop for that. So I think that's weird and yeah. Um, it's hard for me to think about it as anything other than that right now. But perhaps if I had been asked this question two years ago, <laughs> <laughs> um, when I was still visiting Chinatown regularly and saw it as kind of like a a, a playful space uh, where I used to work regularly and run into friends every single day, I would think of it as that. Like, that was perfect. That was a dream to be able to be 
in a space, have comfort food for an affordable price, be able to do a little bit of work, run into friends and community everywhere you go and, you know, feel cared for in that way. That's, that's what I would imagine it to be. Hmm. Thanks, Kimberly. David? Oh, putting me on the spot. <laughs> I was trying. <laughs> yeah, it's a, well, I have so many thoughts because I'm, I'm thinking about our conversation, but also I, um, I've, personally been trying to do some work on so so I'm not a very nature type of person. <laughs> You've got the guardian card now though. <laughs> yes. Um but like I've been trying I've been thinking about like personally what does that you know living in the city not being a nature person but how the sort of colonial in implications of that when we're so forcibly and day to day reinforce this sort of separation of of my relations to not the non-human and, and and the planet right and so i guess that sort of and the i'm so i'm thinking about the heron and i'm thinking about the intertidal zones and th what that might look like for a for, not just for the people in in China town and the history, but of if we're going to think about the future, what that might look like. So I have this like, and the solar punk conversation came um, after we have had a meeting with with both of you. And Jen and I, Jen and I went on a retreat recently to Victoria, and I've been that just really triggered like after our conversation and this idea of solar punk. Um, and Jen, I'm going to butcher the definition of solar punk, but it's sort just of just imagine like it's like the opposite of steampunk. Punk, you know, yeah. it's optimistic. Yeah. It's um, but not <laughs> idealistic. It incorporates like science fiction literature, and yeah. Just, yeah. Yeah, and there was like I don't know how to describe the images from some of these solar punk artists, but there was a there was a joy there. Mm -hmm. There was there was color. Imagination. There was imagination, and so I'm going to leave it at that very conceptual, artsy. <laughs> thing that I'm where I'm situated right now. I see soil, like soil everywhere, like lots yeah. of soil, lots of water open. And yeah, like you give any, you know, BIPOC some soil, they'll, they'll transform it, they'll turn it into lush spaces, and greens. Um, yeah. Go ahead, what, I, what I what I what I was gonna say was, you know, going back to the issue of trauma, and then joy you know it's like mm. it's it's taken me 60 years to get to this place where oh. um you know i can i can get bodily joy but it's because i had to work on it and so the question of do people of color do chinese people go camping you know it's like uh, <laughs> and our our nature our our relationship to the outdoors uh particularly for you know the 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 generation before me and my mm -hmm. generation, uh, the the amount of trauma that we were, you know, sort of embodied in, didn't necessarily let us have a childhood to go camping. You know, it's like yeah. uh, in in apartheid Rhodesia, it's like it would have been unthinkable for us to go camping uh, as Chinese people. I, I it was never sort of encountered. It's dangerous. Uh, yes, uh, but I did have the fortune of going to Mozambique to the coast because there were relatives who, you know, who had immigrated, who had left, who jumped on a boat with my grandfather who, you know, found the first boat they could jump on and they landed up in Mozambique. And so I had, you know, people from our village who lived in Mozambique and they kept inviting us over and there wow. you, I encountered the Indian Ocean. Mm. And it's like, if I hadn't encountered the Indian Ocean, I think, I don't think I would have survived because the Indian Ocean for me was like this place I could retreat to when I was in landlocked Rhodesia and apartheid mm. Rhodesia. It's like there was this, this other world that was possible, right? And so for me, it's, it's kind of like nature is kind of everywhere. It, it's also in the pavement that's behind the, the Sun Yat Sun. Mm. It is, and that was the False Creek waters. Um, but part of the work through, of trauma is to is to work to to really sort of define those those relationships that brought joy um and for me a, it, a really significant one is the indian ocean and just that wildness mm -hmm. and encountering that wildness said to me i could 
create this internal wildness within myself and how do I liberate that internal wildness? So uh, mm. that goes back to, you know, the internal climate system that you have inside of you. Mm. Thanks, Laiwan. And I think that's a really beautiful way to end this conversation. <laughs> we are sadly running out of time. This conversation. We should ask, we should ask the question oh, we yes. ask all our guests, though. Okay, you ask. <laughs> <laughs> what is your favorite hot pot ingredient or experience? Well, I will quickly say that I had never heard of hot pot uh, coming from where I come from. <laughs> and when I first encountered it, I, the first thought I had was, wow, this just blows my mind because everybody puts their food in the same pot. <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> so there, there was a model there for me to figure out in terms of communal nourishment. Mm -hmm. And so that's how I perceive that, that pot in the middle of the, the, the room. But I also see hot pot as like a sexy pot. It's like a hot. <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. <laughs> Kimberly? Yeah. Similarly, I didn't grow up having hot pot. And the first time I did was actually Christmas Eve with my family sometime in the past couple of years. Because we're a Cantonese family. We have a lot of kanji together, but often don't do <laughs> hot pot. Um, my favorite thing to eat with, though, is like anything spicy. I have kind of a spicy addiction. So anything mm. spicy and like just whole cloves of garlic. Um, that's my favorite. Wow. <laughs> oh, rah, rah. Amazing. <laughs> Sounds good. <laughs> Yum. Thank well, you thank, both. <laughs> thank you both so much. Um, don't go away. We're going to say bye to you in just a moment. Let's so introduce our next episode. Uh, mm -hmm. This Friday, we have Tanya. Did we prepare the bio? Yes, you did. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, Tanya uh, Ekanaba is a queer and non binary multidisciplinary artist, musician, and facilitator living on the unceded ancestral territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil Waututh First Nations. They proudly trace their roots to the land of the Ija and Shona speaking peoples, colonially known today as Nigeria and Zimbabwe. Tanya's music, shows, and workshops are connected, soulful, and intimate experiences, soaked in a fresh kind of vulnerability that we all hunger for. When Tanya is not on stage or in the studio, you can find them at Ethos Lab, co-creating a vibrant community and facilitating arts-based learning and leadership programs for youth, or organizing with the Defund 604 network in pursuit of the abolition of police, prisons, and the end of state violence and repression. So that's yes. this uh, Friday, the uh, 18th um, at 5 p.m. Pacific time. Great. Did you want to add anything, Dave? No, uh, just stay, stay tuned for the announcement of the next episodes. You, you know, as, as we announced a couple of weeks ago, due to Omicron, we've had to sort of change the way that we're doing Bitter Orientals just because of the, the we can't do things in person with elders right now. Um, but yeah, stay tuned. Um, there's going to be more um, episodes um, uh, announced uh, very soon. Okay. Have a wonderful, wonderful night.